Hey there, my name's Gary Sims, and this is Gary Explains. Now, I've been working on a video for the Android Authority channel about how much RAM do you need in an Android smartphone for 2019. And in doing that, I have been refreshing my uh, memory about how RAM management works in Linux and in Android. And I thought really it kind of uh, warranted its own video rather than trying to roll that up into a look at how much RAM is actually needed. So the plan is that I'm going to do a video on this channel now about RAM management and then there'll be a follow-up video on the Android Authority channel about how much RAM do you actually need. So if you want to find out more please let me explain. At the heart of the Android operating system is Linux and the Linux kernel. And every time you start a new app, what's actually happening is you're creating a process inside of Linux. Now, a process is responsible for all of the different resources that the kernel might allocate to the different apps. So a CPU time is a resource, kind of input and output, writing files, writing to the network, reading from the network is a resource, and RAM memory is a resource. Now, the thing about CPU time and I.O. is that in one sense, they're infinite. If you have a busy CPU and you want to run a new task, your task will also get a slice of that CPU time. And if it's very busy, it will just take longer. So although it might happen quicker when the CPU is less busy, when it's more busy, it just takes a longer amount of time, but it still gets done. And the same is true of I.O. If you're kind of downloading a big file or you're writing something to the internal storage, if there's other I.O. going on, your I.O. might be delayed but ultimately it will also happen, it just might take longer. However, with RAM, it's kind of a fixed amount. If you run out of RAM, there is no more, and waiting longer for the RAM to kind of magically free itself up is not going to happen. So Android and Linux have to have a system of how it copes with the problem of there being a limited amount of RAM inside of a smartphone. So when you tap on an app, a new process is launched, and that process will say to the Linux kernel, I need this amount of memory just to load the program from the internal storage. So it will start to give it some memory. And then once the program starts to run, it maybe wants to load up some media files, load up some sprites. It might want to download something from the internet. And each of these actions, the process, the app, will say to the Linux kernel, can I have some more memory, please? Can I have another megabyte? Can I have another two megabytes for these files that I'm downloading, for these files that I'm reading? And the Linux kernel will say, yep, here's some memory. You can actually have it now and use it for what you need to. Now, the way it actually works is that uh, Linux has a pool of what we're going to call available memory. Now, that's different to free memory because actually in a multitasking operating system, free memory is a bad thing. You don't want memory sitting there doing nothing. There's always something you can be doing with memory. For example, it can be given over to improving file I.O. or network I.O. for caching. It can be given over to other programs that need to be running. Actually having a large amount of free, empty, unused memory is a bad idea. So Linux, what it does is it uses as much memory as it can, maybe kind of you know up to 95%, something like that, and it uses it for all the different things that it can, uh, that it can do and make that memory useful. But it's also marked as available memory which means at any moment it can be stopped being used as a buffer, stopped being used as some kind of caching, and it can then be given over to a new process. So let's say on the Pixel 3, for example, it's a phone that comes with four gigabytes of memory. Some of that memory is taken up by Linux, some of that memory is taken up by Android itself. And then the available memory, once you kind of reboot the phone in a fresh situation, would be around maybe 1.7 gigabytes. So when an app actually starts up, Linux will look at the available memory and say, here are some chunks that you can use to do the things you want to do. And it actually divides up the memory into pages, let's say four kilobytes pages that it can hand over to different processes as it needs them. Now that's all fine when there is enough memory. When you've just rebooted your phone and you start the first app, well, it's got lots of available memory, 1.7 gigabytes. Here, what do you want? Take as much as you need, not a problem at all. But over time, you start to use other apps and you start to load them into memory. And now the free memory kind of reduces as the number of apps increases. Now at some point, there won't be enough memory, available memory, 
uh, around so that the next app can do the thing it needs to do. And now Linux and Android have a problem. And there are one of two things that it can do. One is it can use swapping, and the other is it can kill an already existing process to free up some memory. So let's look at both of those. So swapping is an idea that we get from servers and desktops, uh, even on Windows and Mac OS and on Linux. It's an idea that's been around for decades. And the idea is that when you don't have enough memory, you can take some of that uh, active memory that's currently in uh, RAM and you can actually write it out to a hard disk. And then you can free up that block of memory, that page of memory. And then later on, if that page is actually needed, then you can read it back from the hard disk and plop it somewhere else in memory. And of course, you want to write out to the hard disk a memory that has not been used or is infrequently used because you don't want to write it out there and then two seconds later have to read it back again. Now, Android doesn't do that uh, to the hard disk. What it actually does is it uses a thing called ZRAM. And Z, of course, in Unix terms, is the symbol for compression. So it's compressed RAM. And what it says is, well, let's allocate a, a chunk of memory here that we're going to use for swapping. But rather than writing it to the disk, what we're going to do is we're going to take the memory, we're going to compress it, and then we're going to store it in this special bit of memory. So let's say you start a new app. It wants some memory. Linux looks at its available memory and says, I don't have enough. Oh, I know what I'll do. I will go down my list of uh, memory pages, and I'll look at what's not used very often, what's not being used at the moment, and I'll kind of compress it down and write it into this area of compressed uh, RAM. So if it had, let's say, 128K of memory that it wasn't using at this very moment, it might compress it down to 64K, write the 64K into the compressed area, and 128K will now become free inside of the uh, main memory. Of course, once it's been written to that compressed memory, it can't be accessed. It's like a zip file. You can't actually access it now. You actually have to write, uncompress it, expand it, and then write it back into main memory if you want to use it. So this is the equivalent of swapping out and swapping back again. And if that piece of memory is needed, then what the kernel will do is it'll actually take that compressed version, expand it, and put it back somewhere into main memory. Now, there is a thing that doesn't happen on, Li on uh, Android with Linux, but it can happen on Linux, and that is where it's forever writing things out to the disk and then reading things back in again, but then to make room for the thing it's reading back in, it has to write something else back out, and you kind of get this cycle of it constantly reading and writing from the swap file, and that's called thrashing. Now, Android doesn't have a problem with thrashing because when it runs out of swap space and when it gets to that point where it can't write more things to the swap file, it just starts killing processes. So as I said, when you've uh, started an app, it becomes a process. And when Linux doesn't have enough free memory, and when it can't get any more memory from using the swap file, what it will do is it will look down that list of memory and it will pick an app that you haven't used for a while or an app that hasn't uh, kind of been executed recently that's still in memory and it kills it. And of course, in killing it, it frees up all the memory that app was using, maybe 300 megabytes, 500 megabytes, whatever that app is, it's gone now. And that memory now can be used for a new app or for an existing app to expand its memory footprint. Now, that might sound a bit brutal because the app kind of just gets, you know, chopped and out it goes. But actually, that's the way Android is designed. When an app gets moved into the background, it knows that it may never come back again. It may die after that. So it has to save its current state. And all apps are written in that way that when they are switched into the background, they save their current state. So what that means is that when you switch using recent apps to a, an app, it could still be in memory, so it just kind of carries on exactly where it left off. Or it may have to start again from fresh, and once it starts, it needs to actually read that state information so that it can work out where it was. Now, sometimes that working out where it was is not seamless because, for example, if you're in the middle of playing a game, it may not bring you back to exactly the same point. It might bring you back to the beginning of that level or something like that. So how well the app copes with this kind of reload situation is dependent on the app and the person that wrote that app. Now, Linux is also very capable of killing off multiple apps if it needs to find bigger amounts of space. So if you start running a game, you know, for example, like uh, Need for Speed, uh, No Limit, then that can take up quite a large chunk of memory. And so it will happily kill out uh, three or four apps from the, uh, from the memory. But they still stay there in the recent apps list because if you do scroll to them using recent apps, it will just reload the app. 
Now this reloading of the app, of course, can cause a slight user experience problem in that you have to wait again while the app reloads. And that's why, of course, having more RAM is better from a user experience point of view. But of course, this other video that I'm working on is how much RAM do you need to actually make that user experience uh, seamless? Okay, so that's about it. So you've got an amount of available memory that the kernel can use. When you start an app that starts a process, the process starts to request memory and uh, Linux hands uh, memory to that process from the available memory. If there's not enough available memory, it can start using the swap file. And then if it needs to, it will kill off existing apps to make way for the foreground app, the one that you've just launched, so that it has a space in memory. One little note is that the way I've described swapping is a little bit uh, simplified because actually the nuances of when it decides to swap uh, some pages of memory out to the ZRAM is actually a bit more complicated, but basically it does it when it's under pressure, internal memory pressure, to find some space for uh, other apps to run inside of main memory. Okay, that's about it. My name's Gary Sims, and this is Gary Explains. So the follow-on to this video will be one on the Android Authority channel about how much RAM do you really need? Is it four gigs, six gigs, eight gigs, 10 gigs? See what I have to say about that in this follow-up video, which is gonna be published very soon. One other thing, yes, I've got new glasses. Move along, move along. Okay, that's it. So if you like this video, please do give it a thumbs up. Please don't forget to subscribe to this channel, and well, that's it. I'll see you in the next one.